What happens if we fail to share what we know? Even though the ocean is vast, marine life is living in the same space as dense traffic, commercial fishing and industrial energy production. If you want to build an offshore wind farm or use the ocean's resources, you need to prove that life in the ocean remains unaffected. If you want to increase the size of fish stocks, you need dynamic no-take zones. If you want to avoid toxic algal bloom attacking your fish farm, you should be able to predict when that will happen. Without sharing fresh data, all of this is fiction. Sharing data is what stands between us and making the ocean what it needs to be. A way of making life on Earth sustainable in the future. That is why we are building an ocean avatar of data of shared knowledge and understanding, a digital representation of the sea in near real time, the ocean data platform. Are you brave enough to share? Explore the ocean by liberating your data and join us. Welcome everybody to the Nordic Pavilion at COP27. Welcome back, I might say. Uh, the topic for this event is uh, Dare to Share. Your future depends on it. It's not a political campaign statement. It's the truth and it is the fact. If we are to find the best solutions to the problem we have caused to our planets and for ourselves, we need sustainable solutions and we need sound governance. Sustainable governance depends on data sharing across borders and across silos. Even though the Nordic and Baltic region see themselves as being in the forefront of data digitalization, we need to pick up the pace. Sharing of data is vital for collecting existing knowledge and testing digital solutions before we make decisions. And it is known that one important actor in this is the industry, which holds a large amount of data. We we'll live on the blue planet. It's a reason why it's called blue. It's called the ocean. You might uh, have guessed the ocean is going to be our example today for the need to share data. Whatever you want to do in the ocean, you need data, so do everyone else so is it possible to split the gain split the bill i mean and uh, divide or share the gain our first speaker today thinks the answer to this question is obvious please give a warm welcome to Newell Tengs Hagen director of business development at the Norwegian mapping industry Newell the stage is yours Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Now, before we start, I always start this presentation with a small session. So please all join me and take a deep breath. Come on, deep breath. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Exhale. Now, two thirds of what you just inhaled are produced in the oceans. And depending on which reports you read, 40 to 60% of it will be stored in the oceans. That's how important the oceans are for us. I always start my presentations with this picture. It's, uh, it's a painting by Erik Varenskjold. It's called uh, Van Schikere. It's in the Norwegian National Museum. And for me, this has always been the embodiment of the fascination mankind has always had about what lies below the surface of the, of the oceans. It's a wonderful picture, and if you're ever in Oslo, you have to see it. Are anyone familiar with the story of Abraham Walt? One is. Bear with me. <laughs> Two is. <laughs> now, during World War II, fighter planes returned from missions, and they were riddled with bullet holes. So what the Allies did was to map out those bullet holes on a sketch, 
in order to know where to reinforce the planes so that more could return back to base. But then a mathematician working as an airport um, maintenance crew, he asked the questions, but what about the airplanes that don't return to base? Perhaps they were shot down where these bullet holes are not on the sketch. So they tested his hypothesis, and of course they reinforced the areas where there were no bullet holes and more planes returned. Now we've all learned that the, the, the moral of the story, of course, in this is that data is only as good as the person analyzing it. But there's a different meaning to it as well. There is always more than one way to interpret data. And that's the important lesson from this. Because if we look at this picture, with Abraham Walt's plane, and we as nations look at our own small parts of the plane, we miss the whole picture. And if we then interpret the data, we risk interpreting them wrong. And if we leave the maintenance and the spatial data infrastructure to private companies and NGOs, then we might have to pay in order to get the whole picture, which is also wrong. Now this map shows what I'm talking about in a very clear detail because it's obvious that whatever every single country does in this ocean, it will have consequences for its neighbors. So the countries could have the world's best management plans for their part of the ocean, but they're still not managing the ocean as an ocean basin and helping each other out. And why are we doing this? This is just a few examples from publications I found about the, the environmental states in the uh, Baltic Sea. And there's literally hundreds of them. So we're proposing um, a project that the Nordic Council of Ministers has uh, agreed to finance in order to put together a collaboration platform where all the national stakeholders will deliver their data and make it readily available, free and open for everyone to use in order to get a proper basin management on board. We see countries that has marine protected areas right up across to the, the border to the neighbor, and on the other side of the border, there's full commercial activity. That's because the, the countries aren't aligned. So we propose to we propose to do this on live data, on Spotify data for geo for geo data, as I call them, which will then allow us to pick the tune when we want it, how we want it, and put them together and make our own actual mel melody. And then we can start using data from other nations together with our own data, and you can get a fuller picture. I see some of my <laughs> figures are missing. I propose a radical new approach, because instead of, instead of staring ourselves blind on SDG number 14, life below water, and its need, I think it's more important that we concentrate on SDG 17, cooperation to reach the goals, and SDG 9, industry, innovation, and inf infrastructure. Because if we can manage to cooperate locally, regionally, nationally, and globally on sharing the data, and if we team up with industry and ac academia, and the nations provide the national infrastructure, then I think we have most of the data needed in order to solve the issues. Hmm. For a lot of the other SDGs and their data needs. Now, the oceans covers 71% of the planet's surface. And it produces more than 50% of the world's oxygen. 
and it, it absorbs about 25% of all carbon dioxide emissions. It's the lungs of the world, but also the world's largest carbon sink. 3.5 billion people are depending on the ocean. And yet, SDG 14 receives 0.01% of all SDG funding. Mr. John Kerry said in on the Monaco week, he said, if you want to solve the climate crisis on this planet, you cannot do it without taking into consideration the ocean. And I fully agree. I have an appeal right at the end. We're getting closer now. And the appeal is stop wasting money. And by that, I mean, when you're funding things, Please think in a value chain. Stop, I mean stop throwing money at the marine biologists. It doesn't work. They can tell you, yes, there's fish here, but they can't tell you why there's fish here. There's a value chain. You need the marine terrain, you need the sediments, you need the currents, the oceanography, the chemistry. And then the marine biologists can say, yes, there's fish here and we know why. We need the whole knowledge base. When you're surveying or when you're planning to survey, talk to other national agencies. What data needs do they have that you can collect at the same time rather than spending public money in the same area over and over and over again? Hear their need for data. Ask them, what data do you need? Why do you need the data? When do you need the data? And how do you use the data? And then, of course, when you're disseminating data, when you're sharing your data, think fair. Think spatial data infrastructure. Talk to the users. Hear their need for the data. Don't put up all your data with Latin names and on what have you. Make them understandable. The metadata has to be understandable for the users. Not everyone is a scientist. And if you're going to save the climate, if you're going to save the planet, you need to make sure that Joe Vlogs in the street understands your data, not just the scientists. And finally, scientists and researchers, you need to share your data now. When I talk to scientists, we're all agreed that time is of the essence. But not for them, because when they have got their, gotten their data, they need to write their scientific papers and their report first, and then they can share the data. And that can take up to three years. You need to share the data now, not in three years' time. The penultimate slide. The ocean needs a champion. Oh, my pictures are not showing. There was to be Superman and Superwoman here. We need a superhero of the oceans. I try to advocate this, but I'm a civil servant. No one listens to me. I'm fully aware of that. Kimberly will meet later on. Anna is here today. And they're both strong voices within their field, but they're not strong enough, I'm sorry to say. Um, we need someone with a global voice. Even Anna Solberg, Norway's former prime minister, her voice isn't big enough. We need a global voice. A global voice that understands the complexity that I've shown you and understands the processes behind it. And a voice that will ring out clear and world will understand. That's what we need. And if anyone feels the calling, please feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. We can talk about that. I'm Njol Tengsager. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for this uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, please have a seat and I will also invite up uh, Anna Selsing, Chief Sustainability Officer at Alpha Laval. I Thank remembered. You. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes. Um, and I would also like to welcome another guest um, because regions and countries are important in this, but we also have NGOs and nonprofit organizations. And let me introduce to you, hopefully, there she is, a lady that is really passionate about sharing data. 
former head of Microsoft Norway, now CEO of the non-profit organization uh, Ocean, Hub Ocean. And uh, Kimberly Matthiesen, welcome. It's so nice to have you with us online from Oslo, Norway. Hello, hello, Egypt. <laughs> can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I'm Definitely. so glad the technology works. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's just a couple of days before I can be there with you myself. I will be coming down soon, but thank you so much for the opportunity to join remotely. <laughs> we we love, would love to see you live here as well, so you're so welcome. But anyway, I, 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 let me start by asking Kimberly, why is sharing data so important to you? Oh, yes. So, well, Neil, let me just say, um, you're a superman in my book, Neil. Um, and so uh, let me build on some of the things that you just said there. You know, the ocean, the, the, the absolute criticalness and the sense of urgency we have to have around this ocean is really the driver. What we don't know about the ocean and what data and digitalization can do for us is just so profound. I've spent over 25 years of my career in business. I've spent the last many years deeply um, in all forms and different spaces with some of the most innovative technology on the planet. And I believe with all my heart that I've seen the art of the possible, that we can use this digitalization and this growing set of data that we have to address this space. And, and, and frankly, I can't think of a space which can benefit more um, from the, the technologies that are available if we can find out how to deploy them and collaborate on them, right? This ocean that is still so unmapped over-exploited, poorly governed, the difference that more insight can make, data can make, and transparency can make, it's really profound. So that's what's driving me. And you have also talked about all the data that the government possesses. You showed us a slide here with all the governmental institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but what can Hub Ocean do that they can't? Yeah, so... You mentioned industry data, right? There's um, what Hub Ocean really endeavors to do is to aggregate data sources from everywhere. And thankfully, there's some jobs that we don't have to do because they're being done extremely well. And the set of data that Newell indicates from Norway and from many, many countries, there are wonderful um, pots of open data, authoritative data, right? There are wonderful aggregated global databases. Those are places to start, but there are many, many other types of data sets, small ones, which if we could collect them together, could be really meaningful. Industrial data sets, which frankly, we've only begun to open up. There is such a richness there. And so what Hub Ocean's mission in all of this is, is to provide connectivity to all of those sources, take away the complexity that many, many, many organizations and the duplication that we would face of trying to get these out front and center and connected. But more than anything, perhaps, it's to foster all of us to get our data and our mindsets truly out of these remarkably robust silos that we've grown up putting them in and make them work together. And so that's, that's what we aim to bring to the party. So, so you want uh, the private sector to pitch in on sharing or the sharing of data, but let me ask you, are they willing to share? Oh, the private sector? Is that what you yes. said? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we'll look, um, I could talk a long time about the distance we still can go, the opportunity in sharing data across the board, but let me address industry specifically. Oh, we have a big job to do. There's a massive amount of data. Look, I'm, I, 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 I am very, very clear that part of this mission is to reset the needle on what industry views as appropriate to share, right? And, and, and let's just acknowledge that we have a long way to go. We have a lot of companies who really want to do the right thing, but think about it. We set up industry in many, many, many cases with a really wrong kind of thinking from the start. I always refer to oil and gas when I give an, you know, when I think about this is, we gave oil and gas licenses out. Uh, Norway did this, we've done this around the world. And we let oil and gas companies, we let, we let companies take out those natural resources in our ocean, which is one of the most important common assets that we have. 
And we asked for so little insight in return, right? We largely, as a public, we lent one of our most important goods to this exercise. And we really got no information out of it in return about what the other implications and the other impacts were. That isn't a way we would want to set this up again, right? We would want to correct that and rectify that. But we're really entrenched around these as an example in industry and silos. And so it takes a heck of a lot of what I believe you could say is both carrot and stick um, to work this terrain to really bring these, you know, this mindset change and action taking apart. It's going to take willing willingness to share, but it also takes a lot of forced transparency, right? Regulations to share. And it, you have to work really hard to look at these value cases as well. Mm. They are there. There's a possibility to redesign for the common good and industry can also win in that. Mm. But by all means, it's, a, it's, a, it's an innovative and complex challenge to mm. take on. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, and uh, I think it's time also to, to bring in the private sector here. Uh, as, and as Kimberly, as I heard Kimberly, it was about trust and it's about transparency. And uh, Anna Selsing, you, you are the Chief Sustainability Officer at, at Alpha Laval. Um, what do you, Alpha Laval need to be comfortable sharing your data? That, that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, and it's complex, but let me just tell you a bit about what Alpha Laval is. Uh, and in this context, uh, we have a global presence and a, a wide span of technology that we do. Uh, we are technology leaders within heat transfer, within fluid handling and separation. But we also have a company within our group called StormU, uh, who is collecting data and uh, weather forecasting to save carbon emissions for the marine industry uh, and fuel. So saving 1 million tons of fuels by optimizing the routes of the ships every year. Mm. Uh, and uh, to your question, um, we need, I think as Kibbele said, we need regulations. Uh, we need uh, them to be fair. We need uh, regulations to be monitored. Uh, we need to secure our data somehow because in our technology leadership is the ownership of the data. So I think as Newell said that it depends also on what data you want. If you are very specific on what data you want and why, then it would be easier for us to share the data. Uh, we will not share all the data. This I think it's very important to go back to what's the drive to create the data. It's very often commercial in the beginning. But in the beginning, that's where our technology leadership lies in. But when we have that leadership and create the data, then we also inspire regulations to get in place. And when we've inspired regulations, then everybody's starting to collect the data. and as a third step, then the data becomes a commodity and we can share it. So there's, I think it's very important to just not talk about broadly data, uh, but as you said again, we need to know what data we, mm. we want and why. So um, to what extent do Alpha Laval share their data today? It also depends, but let me let me focus on the marine sector and the ocean. And if I also specifically, I know Kimberly knows uh, Stormio and my colleagues there. Uh, and we are both dependent on open source, high quality databases that we use. And we, uh, they, for example, we collect data on historical current uh, observations that we share. That is one small part, but mm. there's a lot that we do not share. Mm. And Kim really knows that uh, <laughs> uh, because it's in our technology leadership. Mm. And we don't have regulations at the moment mm. that we can trust in, mm. unfortunately. <laughs> Newell, you had your hand up. Um, because I, I've been standing in this for, for several years now, and I've been talking to the oil and gas companies in, in Norway. Um, there's something like 1,600 active licenses in, in uh, the Norwegian waters. Um, and by the end of this year, we will have an agreement in place 
where the oil and gas companies share all the data with us. And when I say all the data, of course I don't mean all the data, yeah. because some of them are business critical data. But luckily for us, bathymetry isn't. Uh, the marine landforms aren't. Um, the water column data isn't. Uh, coral sightings aren't, you know? So we will finally get our hands on that and we can then get a much larger picture of the data in, the, in our basins that we can start working with, together with Kimberly and others in doing that. But can I just say one thing? Um, and that goes out to if there are anyone watching now who is actually a, a, an advisor to any policymakers. And that is, we saw Solveig uh, Lundegaard uh, previously talking about uh, what is exactly essentially the Lung Sheep project, which is basically a 27 billion kroner investment, whereby you extract CO2 from uh, Norsem, the cement factory, you put it on ships and you dump them 2,600 meters below the bottom of the sea in, in geological formations. Now, to begin with, that will remove 1.5 million tons of CO2 every year. And when it's fully operational, 5 million tons CO2 every year. Now, 1 million, 1 and a half million tons CO2 is ex equivalent to what kelp forests, 100 square kilometers of kelp forests bind of carbon. And that's free. It's called photosynthesis. But the problem is, whenever there's a big, sexy technology, bleeding edge project, the politicians throw their money at it, instead of thinking, hang on, what will give me most bang for the buck? I can invest there, because that's a, a very important long-term investment to do in competence and knowledge. But at the same time, I can actually use some money to, to identify the correct areas where we can start restoring the kelp forest and in Norway we have 8,000 square kilometers that can be restored by the way and do both but somehow dear policymakers if you're watching you fail to see it Kimberly I don't know if you want to comment on what Neil just said in both basically both what Anna said and what Neil said here because um, I think Anna fairly points out that there haven't there hasn't been enough clarity or lifting of the scientific voice, the need, the rationale and the opportunity to take industry data and plug it into the right places and make it work hard and make it matter. And I find that a lot that organizations are actually willing to share oftentimes the kinds of data which are first and foremost what we're going after to collect things like Newell was talking about salinity and temperature and you know, currents across the top of the water, currents across the seafloor, biological biodiversity information, right? Have you ever wondered how much biodiversity information there might be in those seismic water column pictures that industry has shot over and over and over and over again? Where is that data, for example? So to point out and lift the voice of science and to shape these data recipes and be very specific then, for what the requests are, it is the right work to do. And then I would challenge those who have honest position in the world, because the next step is, right, we'll lift the voice up, but please you need to prioritize to then be interested enough to do the work. It is not the top of the agenda very often. It has to be prioritized work. It has to have to be several champions in the organization that look for what's the right thing to do, what can we do and must we do for the environment and the footprint and the impact that we're having broader than profits, right? But also the happy news here is I can, I can tell you, we start to collect many, many interesting examples. Uh-oh, I think you froze up on us now, Kimberly. I don't know if you, you can hear us, but meanwhile, I'm, I'm gonna go to, to, to Newell and, and Anna here. Um, um, I could sense some frustration in Kimberley about the pace and, and the, direction, the direction we are going in. So uh, how can we create a transparent and trustworthy structure for collaboration on, and partnerships between public and private sector? Anna, would you, would you start on that one? <laughs> yes, I, I think it again goes back to those monitoring of regulations because you 
there is a competition within this, both when it's uh, on the private and public sector. I see institutes that, as you say, Noel, you want your paper published and you want to keep your data. Uh, and it's we want to keep our data to, because it's bi uh, business critical sometimes. And we need to ha have a, a monitoring that really then gives us those who want to do the right thing the, the benefits of that and the opposite. And I think one other way would be also to sit down together and talk about it and talk about what we really need and start somewhere. Uh, to talk to you, Neil, to talk to you, Kimberly, and discuss and start somewhere with that data that might not be critical because both of you say, and I agree, there, there is data that's not critical. I, I think that's a starting point at least. Mm. Neil, what do you think? Uh, just to pick up what, what Anna said, I think we have a lot to gain with us from yeah. governmental agencies talking to the industry and talking to people like Kimberly, which I admire deeply, and, and the work sh that she's doing is wonderful. Uh, but I think we need to sit around the table, all three of us, look each other in the eyes, start building trust. Um, and then, of course, and I'm, I'm kicking the ball back to you and Kimberly, you're both from the IT world. Then, of course, I'm talking about Spotify for geodata, open, transparent, and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, it has to be open and transparent. But then again, we need to make sure that um, an end user don't trust the data just because I say so. They're my data, you can trust them. But you need technology in order so the data aren't manipulated on the way from me out to the user. So there's another level here that I've never really gone into. I've just assumed that I'd find someone who I could talk to who could solve my problems. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, talking about Spotify for data, you, you have a slightly different approach, but still pretty much the same. Blockchain. You, you think we, we need regulated blockchain to, to, to solve this, don't you, Anna? Yes, I, I think blockchain uh, is one uh, part of the solution, or could be, uh, because just I love the, the analogy of Spotify and and going back to Spotify, that was also created from a commercial drive. So it it's always is. Uh, and I think that we need to, as we said, we need to make sure that I feel confident and feel trust that my data is used as for the good and not for competing against me and taking my technology leadership. Uh, because that would be irresponsible for me because there's employees that wouldn't be employed anymore. Uh, so... I need, we need uh, the blockchains in some cases to secure that when I send your, your, the data, it really goes to you and you can know that it's the right quality also. Nobody manipulated the data on the way there. And I know that you're using it. So it's one key to the problem. Kimberly, w we lost you there for a, a couple of seconds. I don't know if you actually heard us while you w were away. Did you? Uh, well, I was busy talking while I was away, and then okay. uh, and then I flipped back on, and I got to listen to Anna, Anna uh, there before okay. um, as, as, as you were picking up. But yeah, I can. What do, do you have? New question for me, or I was yeah. happy to respond to what Anna was you, saying. You, you, could, you could actually pick up on what Neil and Anna just said if you heard them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I did. So I mean, from a technology perspective, um, blockchain. I fully agree with what um, Anna said, uh, and and what Neil's call is, and I think that that's one thing we. Uh, players like myself have ocean, we assign ourselves the job of being very, very technically adept, both with data and handling contextualization, uh, metadata tagging, um, data cataloging, right? To make all of this possible and get rid of the complexity. But of course we're building on, you know, the world's leading cloud-based security technologies, et cetera, right? To have that platform itself offer a very elegant, safe, cyber secure, modern, agile space. And there are, that, that alone can provide enormous value into the mix because very many times, right? The public authorities, the big databases of the world, they may not have had the opportunity to have the funding or the skills, right? That it takes to keep those kinds of scaled cybersecurity platforms 
um, available, right? So we're building open source to the degree we absolutely can. We also lean into the modern technologies of, for example, Microsoft's cloud and build that into our model. So leaning on the best, providing new tools and new platforms, I think is fundamental to, um, I think is fundamentally additive to what otherwise can, can you know, strand efforts along the way. Mm-hmm. So the, the organizational form that in, in my case, right, we're an independent foundation assigning ourselves to be, to have some special superpowers, if you will, with, with technology in the ocean domain with data can really lean in here. And I hope create a new space for this old term, which we've worked so hard at over the years to create public private partnerships, right? Mm. We need them more than ever, but I hope forms like this and our work, for example, with Njol and the other authorities in Norway and then scaling to the rest of the world, I really passionately hope that we can create some out of the box thinking through this new kind of, if you will, leaning into different organizational forms and really you know, putting a modern touch on what we haven't maybe thought about in terms of approach before. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, another question uh, to, to, to Newell and Anna here. I mean, how can we ensure that the data we share is utilized for the broader benefit of society? Because, uh, I mean, we will not be able or willing to share if we not, don't see the broader benefit, will we? Or, Newell, I'm looking at you this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel that uh, one thing is what Kimberly is advocating is to, to share your data as much as possible, uh, as much of the data as possible. But there are some inherent problems in that. Um, some of the data are extremely proprietary. So, so basically, um, if it's all formats and all data and everything, the knowledge perhaps is lost on how to use them and how to reformat them, to be quite honest. Um, so we need, we need to make sure that um, the data that goes through the spatial data infrastructure, which I represent, are open. Uh, it's open source based. Um, it's according to the FAIR principles and the CARE principles. Um, and it's based on me talking to Anna, I'm talking to Kimberly, and talking to uh, the local fishermen to find out what is it you need. Mm. Uh, because if you can tell me, if you manage to articulate what you need, I can see if I can provide. Um, and in a sense, if we, if we stick to the open standards, if we stick to OGC, if we stick to fair principles, then the possibilities for the data are endless. They can be used by uh, ocean researchers, by uh, local fishermen, and as I said, by uh, the oil and gas industry, by the, the carbon uh, sequestering industry, by, by everyone. Um, and that's what kind of drives me. It's the fact that we need to have as much open data as possible in order to put together a neutral base of knowledge that we can sort of give to the politicians and say, right, here's the data. Kimberly's made this wonderful model that can actually show you the consequences of your actions in an area based on neutral data. It's not my job to tell you how to use the data or, and what they can be used for and how you should use them. That's for the users to tell me. Anna? I'd like to just get back to what Kimberly said also. Uh, and then adding, you said that I think we know so little about oceans. Uh, and I think there's a great need to create even more awareness for everybody to understand the need of data, to create a more, even more sense of urgency. We know all here, I think, that it's so critical for uh, the future. And it's connected to climate crisis, biodiversity, everything. And we rely on it, as you say, Newell. But I'm not sure, I don't think we have that understanding everywhere. Uh, and if we did, I think it would g- go easier forward and we would get faster to a solution with the partnerships, with the trust, and start getting those roundtables discussions going. I want to uh, go back to Kimberly here, uh, because I mean, um, Newell uh, kind of uh, screamed out for a superhero uh, in this uh, 
share, data sharing um, need we have. Um, but is it is, is that too simple to have just one or maybe several superheroes? Uh, what about the politicians? I mean, they are the Ooh. one regulating what uh, we all um, do in our everyday lives, even even in this area. They re they should regulate, but. From what I hear you guys are saying, you're actually lacking regulation and maybe perhaps knowledge. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. so so I think uh, everybody can be a superhero in this exercise. You know, I heard someone say last week that they also thought we might benefit from having, you know, a, a, an angry but effective change-making uh, Swedish teenager who really took on oceans, not climate, but oceans as her passion, right? No doubt oceans would benefit from that. So look, I'm all for everybody becoming a superhero every day they can. We, we need all efforts in. But to your point about, you know, regulators, look, I, I think um, some, you know, I think all parts of the uh, of, of society and all of our actors, we're all working on rewiring our thinking pretty fundamentally here. It's very simplistic in my world to say, hey, we haven't come as far as we should have because industry did a bunch of bad things and they need to do better things or because um, our politicians didn't regulate and take the responsibility they should. I mean, I, I think the fact is, is that we all have to frankly admit we were all complicit complicit in this cycle of reinforcing each other, right? We, we elect politicians based on public opinion, right? There's so many things that we behaviorally as human beings, we do not do today, but we might've seen our parents do, or we might've done when we were a kid, like throwing garbage out the window of the car, for heaven's sake. Like I know a lot of people in my age group that did that when we were little. I mean, I can't even imagine my children throwing a bag of McDonald's out the window of a car anymore, right? So we've all come so far. And the great thing in that is now there's more, there's little room and increasingly less room for anybody to sit and not take responsibility as they should. And frankly, data and transparency that it creates, I actually think that that transparency and that better data is probably one of the single most important forces for good. And sometimes I think it's about saving us humans from ourselves right? Because we're so good at creating your group and that group and blaming and putting our finger together. I think the transparency and the no place to hide anymore, and then the absolute turning a light bulb on, on the ocean to give governments more insight, for example, the governments are craving and hungry for much more insight so that they can take the right decisions, which their economies very, very often depend super heavily on. And many feel completely blind in this exercise. So we must put our data together, lift the voice of science, aggregate all these beautiful sets of data out there, which have no chance of working together and actually getting to driving that impact and being at the fingertips of nations, which might not have so many resources to use them, right? So it's very promising in terms of its impact. And we must pursue that route, among other routes, to give the policymakers and the regulators a whole new level of insight that they can then act on. That's a key part of the equation. Thank you, Kimberly. Anna, you want to be a superhero? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you see private sector actually going all in, kicking down doors and demanding regulation from the politicians and even transparency from your um, colleagues in other uh, companies and so on and so forth? That's a big question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I think and maybe those big questions should be answered by small steps <laughs> also, but every, every day. Uh, I think that one thing that we I would like to get back to, I think that roundtable discussion is very important. We have to understand each other's perspective better. Uh, and I think that in everything, we have a big part of our industry or that we work in is marine, in the marine sector. And we very much work together with different companies. We provide sustainable solutions like preventing pollutions. Uh, we reduce carbon emissions by millions of tons. Uh, the Storm U example with 30 million tons of CO2 is just a, a small piece of what we do and together, all together in the company. So I think there's not one answer to that very complex 
uh, question, but I, I would like to start with this discussion, creating trust and understanding what data should we get to first? Because that first step is the first step of a long journey and that will bring us to something, I think. Totally agree with, with you, Anna. Uh, I think the, the most important thing we can do is actually sit down and talk. Um, and and I no, I'm not only talking about the good guys. Uh, we need everyone around the table, uh, even the bad guys around the table. Because if we can't, if we can't beat them, at least let them join us and then convert them that way. Um, and I want you to know, both Anna and, and Kimberly and, and others as well, is, is uh, me coming from the government sector. I mean, I, my job is to watch your back, uh, to, to make sure that you, you have it, data when you need the data um, and at a certain kind of quality. But it's a, it's a kind of a give and take. Um, so instead of having a sort of a super highway going from my, my part over to you, I'd like to have something back because you create new knowledge and I'd like to have that knowledge as well that I can then share with others again who would create new knowledge on top of that again and so on. And that symbiosis is quite important. Do we, we have that very concrete trust? about that before uh, we on, move on? Come on, Kimberly. You, you are actually just sitting behind me, so I didn't see you. Sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. No, so <laughs> I just wanted to pick Anna up on her offer there because Niol and I have started a, a, a certain set of discussions where we're very determined to get a pilot up and running. We've started that, uh, you know, some our organizations have been speaking together for some time, but we started that and, and with more determination and specificity recently. So Anna, join us because the colleagues you have in Storm Geo and the, the zone, I mean, I'm very aware that we have a global mandate every day in Hub Ocean, but I am also, you know, really, really happy that we're able to work in the Nordic domain um, and in the Norwegian domain, because here we have, you know, we have a certain ability to capitalize on this forward leaningness that we've had in our cultures for a long time, this trust that we have, right? These short lines of communication. There's no better laboratory in my mind on the planet than to sit around that table. So let's do it, Anna. Can we invite you? Can we sit around that table? Noel and I already have a table. We already have a time. So it's, it's just to bring you in and let's cook up some passion and some very specific ways to make a difference. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Yes, it would be very good. I know that the Storm Geo, uh, uh, team has a lot of data also that they uh, would guide you to, not just our own, but they know a lot about open data sources with high quality, and I think there's a lot to learn. I agree. Ex excellent idea, uh, Kimberly. Excellent idea. Uh, yeah, looking forward to this. <laughs> and I think with that, that was the perfect ending, uh, Kimberly. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, we achieved something here as well today. Thank you. <laughs> Kimli Matisen, uh, CEO of uh, Hub Ocean. Njol Tengs Hager uh, from uh, the Norwegian Mapping Authority. And Anna Selsing, uh, Chief Sustainable Officer. I remembered it again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And uh, before we leave, Kimberly, we, we have to actually go now because we are going to be a part of an uh, art project here. Breathe with me. Oh, so um, you, you can come by and you will, uh, you, you will uh, be able to join us when you get down here. Wonderful. Enjoy and I'll see you soon. See you in a couple days. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>